you know where Lawrence North is. All right, good. Yeah, we used to be on Hank Road there, along with 11 other churches. And uh, we decided about four years ago that the demographics was a bit crowded over there for churches, that we could do better somewhere else. So we took the bold move and we sold our building and our land and everything else that we had occupying in there. And we moved into the YMCA in Lawrence, so just about two or three blocks over from here. We've been there for the last three and a half years. Um, a small congregation there. Uh, we moved over with about 25 people, and we still have about 25, although they're all different 25 than they were. Um, since that time, we have expanded into three senior living centers. Um, Elmcroft, which is at the corner of Franklin and 56, and uh, Traditions, which is out in McCordsville, and then Miller's, which is in Castleton. And that came about um, very providentially by God's hand. Um, we moved into the YMCA because we had it figured out. We were going to get younger. We were going to have a younger congregation. And so we moved over with our 40, 50, and 60-year-olds. And we ended up with 70, 80, 90, and 100-year-olds. God forgot to tell us that right next to the YMCA was a senior apartment building, many of whom did not have their own transportation. So on Sunday mornings, it was an easy walk across the parking lot. And so we've grown. Um, we've tripled or quadrupled um, our worship group in four locations. And uh, it's just gotten older. We are constantly growing, constantly looking at serving. One of the things that uh, we look at doing is fostering, along with the YMCA, this idea of body, mind, and spirit health. Um, I don't know if you know that the YMCA, at least for the longest period of time, was started as a Christian organization um, to care for the industrialized workforce in Great Britain and uh, moved over to this side of the pond, they say, and uh, carried on that tradition, and we are carrying it on there. Uh, on top of all of the pastoral duties that I do regularly, I'm also the chaplain at the YMCA, as well as at Elmcroft and at Traditions. So um, in my spare time, we do conferences. So you are the recipients of our first conference. We have another coming up in March, and we'll give you more information of that or remind you about that March the 21st. And uh, this one, as you know, is on change your brain, on mind health. And having just moved my folks into a senior living center where their memories are going, uh, we all know how crucial that is. And uh, if you're there, this is for you. If you're not there, this is really for you. Um, the next one is going to be looking at physical health. Um, no, we're not going to have you exercising and doing all of that, but uh, we are going to tell you why you need to keep up your health um, and what all of that means, and uh, we'll go from there. And we've got uh, three of them scheduled over the next four months, and uh, tonight's guest is Nathan Day Wilson. He is the communications director for Christian Seminary, uh, so on the other side of town. So we've imported him all the way from the other side of town, which makes him an expert, by the way. <laughs> We're paying him, and he came from the other side of town, so he is an expert. Um, no, he's done extensive research on brain health and how to improve that. And I know we've all heard do lots of Sudoku and do lots of puzzles and do lots of whatever. Um, he's going to give you kind of the real scoop on a lot of that and uh, what are some of the things you really can do. So with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Nathan. Um, please welcome him along with me. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that very much. 
very much. So there are a couple of seats, it looks like, up here and some scattered throughout. And I think that there are more chairs if we need to bring them up. So the greatest change about face, the greatest reversal in biological history, and quite possibly in the top three of all science, is the changed understanding about the adult brain. You may have thought, as many did for a long time, that you were born with a fixed number of neurons. You could do some uh, adjustment to those, and then at about age 25 or so, the brain was fully developed. And at that point, it was basically a matter of decline after age 25. It's a terribly sad story, is it not? Well, now we know that's not true. That's not the case. Neurogenesis can continue well past uh, age 25 in our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, beyond. And we know more and more about how that neurogenesis can happen. Neurogenesis, the first part of the word neuro meaning neuron, which is the brain cell, and the second part of the word meaning genesis, which is to begin or to initiate. So neurogenesis, the development of, of neurons in the brain. Now the brain, let's just start right there, is of course uh, terribly fascinating, the most complex organ that we know of, uh, at least. It is uh, filled with uh, an adult, adult brain, has an estimated 100 billion neurons, a neuron being the brain cell, most complicated cell in the human body. On each of those neurons are uh, dendrites, and they are like roots of a tree, and they intersect with other dendrites. And so uh, there may be 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion synaptical connections, synapses, between the different neurons in the brain. And each of these, depending on what type of neuron it is, is firing from anywhere from 10 times to 100 times per second, uh, almost all the time, almost 24 hours a day, not quite. Again, it depends on what type of neuron it is. So just, I mean, you can't really imagine it, but pretend like you could for a second. It is so incredible. And frankly, you're doing so little with that, right, that it's just an amazing thing. So for humans, we have essentially three parts to our brain. Um, and I'll give you a kind of a roadmap in a second. I'm just spouting off the top right now, but we'll, we'll get down to business here in a minute. We have basically three parts of our brain. We have the reptilian brain, the brain stem, which is uh, uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic. It ties into the autonomic nervous system. It's basically your fight or flight. Yeah. So you're faced with something, you decide whether to flee from it or fight against it. Uh, it's reptilian. Um, the second part is the limbic system, which is what we have in common with mammals, and so. All of, our, um, all, all of our sibling mammals out there have a whole bunch of our brain in common with, with each other. And in the limbic system, uh, we develop beyond the reptilian brain to things like uh, touch and the appreciation for touch and ability to reason uh, to a degree. And then the third part of the brain for humans is the prefrontal cortex. And uh, that's the part of the brain that for humans is much larger than for other mammals uh, in, in relation to the overall size of the brain. And that's where we have the much more developed abilities to think and, and to reason. So what we're going to talk about today is the development of new neurons, neurogenesis, particularly in the prefrontal cortex, mainly in what's called the hippocampus and the olfactory region of the prefrontal cortex. Okay. So tell me if you have heard this statement before. Just, I'm just putting it out there. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You ever heard that? Tug on your right ear. I just wanted to see how many people could do that. <laughs> um, so, you know, the idea, the thing I like about that statement, that there's more than one thing, but one of the things I like about this statement is it points to this holistic this holism that is us, heart, soul, mind, and strength, uh, that we are integrated, that we are a whole body, that we can't really separate, or we shouldn't really attempt to separate, 
these different portions of ourselves. So that's essentially the roadmap I'm going to use tonight. I'm going to talk about how we go about neurogenesis, heart, mind, soul, and strength. Okay? So let's start with the heart. Now, by heart, I'm focusing not on the physical heart. That'll be under strength. That'll be kind of my synonym for body. With heart, I'm talking about emotions. The need for a supportive emotional environment for good brain development cannot be overstated. Emotion is essential to the organization of the brain, to the function and the working of the brain. The right kind of emotional stimulation leads to increased neurogenesis, and the wrong kind shuts down neural development. So let's talk, for instance, about relationships. Relationships are key. Many of us, I think, take this for granted, but relationships are absolutely key to our ability to develop in a healthy way, develop our brain in a healthy way. When you feel good and comfortable and secure, neurogenesis is much more likely. When you feel insecure, when you feel threatened, neurogenesis shuts down. Your brain development shuts down. There's a significant body of research that indicates that emotional stability and positive emotional environment is helpful for this growth and is, in fact, neuroprotective. So it's not just a matter of generating more neurons and thus having a greater likelihood of becoming smarter. More neurons does not equate to better function by itself. We'll talk about that in a second. But an emotionally stable environment can be neuroprotective so that even when there's a lack of stimulation in some of the other areas, if you're in an emotionally stable environment, it can still protect you against that. The opposite, like I said, is true. Ongoing, persistent stress, despair, lack of engagement, depression, these all negatively impact neurogenesis. Negative relationships, same thing. Those who, if you're around people who are chronically angry or constantly inducing fear, domineering, these run the risk of serious physical and emotional and neuro health, detriment to your health. Let me tell you a quick story about a man named Dan. And I'll call him Dan because that's his name. Dan had a very difficult childhood. I appreciate you laughing. The night is young. Dan was bullied by his three older brothers. His father was constantly angry. His mother was perhaps overwhelmed, but also certainly not very protective. Dan started visiting the church where I preached at the time after reading some of my newspaper columns. And when he learned that I did fitness training, Dan asked me if we could do some fitness training work together as well. Because he was convinced that the reason he could not keep a long-term relationship with a woman was due to his lack of physical fitness. Dan was a paramedic, incidentally, and not in the worst shape, not in the best shape in the world, but certainly not in the worst shape in the world either. So anyways, from the beginning, our relationship was this kind of mixture of pastoral counseling and fitness training, and then we kind of moved into some of the cognitive training and so on later on. And we noticed some things after spending some time together. For instance, Dan's diet was extremely high in carbs and sugar, simple sugars, and he was open to changing that. He was open to changing his belief that all men were out to get him, which I think was a direct result of growing up in a very bullying environment. And spiritually, he was willing to give church a try and to give prayer a try, even though he made it clear to me he wasn't sure what he believed. In fact, he made some funny statements about prayer. I'm not really sure what's going on there, but I'll still pretend like I'm doing it or things to that effect. So, but it was at this emotional level that most of the work needed to happen. You see, Dan was suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. But the trauma in this case was the bullying relationship with his brothers and his father being chronically angry growing up. 
So as we began to unpack that and began to put all these different, again, holistically, putting all these pieces together, pulling them apart and realizing how they interact with each other, Dan was able to begin to trust others. He began to engage more deeply. He felt less stress in his relationships. He started taking an Ivy Tech class at the local campus where we were. And at that Ivy Tech class, he met a woman, and he was willing for once to kind of begin to trust and open up to her. His physical health improved. All of this happened very holistically. All of this happened because he finally was in a much more emotionally stable situation. Humans, we share this emotional brain, this limbic system, like I said, with other mammals. But our emotional lives are, of course, much more complex. So I want to say again, the reason I'm starting with this, not only does it fit into the statement that I began with, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but I'm starting with this because emotional stability, all the, all the mind uh, games that we're, we will talk about, all the mind efforts that we will talk about, all the nutritional supplements that we will talk about, all the physical ways to stimulate neurogenesis that we will talk about, all of that depends on uh, a base of emotional stability. It's absolutely essential to um, neural growth. Dan uh, Siegel, who is a, a neurologist and whose book is on the bibliography, if you did not pick up a copy of the bibliography, it's, it's in the back, and I hope you will, says in, in that book that I note there, emotion wires the brain and organizes how we experience the world. It helps us shape our information and our energy flow across blank brain system so that we can integrate various data into an integrated experience of living. Now, in the training that I do with folks individually, uh, fitness training and uh, cognitive training, uh, we sometimes talk about different types of stressful relationships as a way to unpack these because as we kind of know this instinctively, but it helps to spell it out. A stressful relationship with a child is different than a stressful relationship with spouse, which is different than a stressful relationship with a parent, right? Stressful relationship with work with someone who reports to you is different than that with a colleague, is different than that with a boss. And so when, we, when I'm doing this with folks one-on-one, -on -one, we unpack what those relationships look like because how you then deal with those stressful relationships also changes depending on what the type of relationship is. But I'm not going to do that tonight for sake of time. Rather, would like to ask just pose some questions to you for you to think about, not for you to answer out loud. Um, are there people in your life who love you for who you are? Or are you trying to get love for a, a self-image that you've carried around? Do you have friends around whom you can relax, who you can trust? Are you connected to a mentor who helps guide you in your job or life decisions? Again, not someone who answers those questions for you, but helps guide you as you answer those questions yourself. And do you feel that you can be intimate, loving, and vulnerable with significant others in your life? So just questions to think about, because these all point to this need for emotional stability. Last thing that I'll touch on in, in this uh, kind of beginning section, um, is um, lots of times when I'm working with people around this and we talk about love and so on, eventually someone will come up and kind of shyly ask about romantic love and about the impact of that or making love on neurogenesis. The short answer is that um, romantic love and, uh, and, the, and making love is beneficial to neurogenesis. I'll touch on this again later on during the body section, the strength section. But the reason is oxytocin is released. Um, you know, that's the love hormone. And oxytocin, oxytocin is released right after, during and right after childbirth, for example. It's released during nursing, uh, during sex, and particularly during orgasm. And in other times of deep, trusted relationship and emotional intimacy, uh, neurogenesis is uh, stimulated, it is released. But, and here, here's, here's the important point, it requires this kind of emotional trust, emotional attunement. Uh, now, needless to say, in 
all of this, I'm talking about sex that is consensual. But it requires an emotional attunement, and that's what leads to the neurogenesis. The act itself does, but more than that is the emotional attunement. A Princeton scientist who calls herself a sex doctor, I guess there are worse things to be a doctor in, talks about the impact of sex on brain development, and she puts it this way. Positive sexual interactions facilitate cell proliferation and survival, whereas adverse social interactions lead to stress and impaired neurogenesis. So, the heart, the emotions, key to organizing the brain, key to your neural development. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second part is soul. Now, for the purpose of this, soul and spirit, in reference to what Pastor Mike said a minute ago, for me are essentially synonyms. Spirituality, as you would imagine, has not exactly been a prime topic for scientific research, but among the sciences, neuroscience has likely been the branch that has been most interested in spirituality and spiritual practices, mainly to try to figure out what the impact that various spiritual practices has been on the brain. At Harvard, one could say of all places, a researcher named Herbert Benson, back in the early 1970s, began to study transcendental meditation. Do you know what transcendental meditation is? Not always, but typically it's characterized by the repetition of a mantra, a word or a phrase or an idea that one says either aloud or not over and over again. The Christian prayer of the heart, for example, is a form of a mantra meditation. And what Benson discovered is that regular meditation produced a response in the body that activated this reptilian system, this parasympathetic nervous system, and had a very calming effect. By the way, if I kind of geek out on this stuff and start talking way too fast, just like raise your hand or, I don't know, do something else if it gets my attention and I'll try to slow down some. And so it calms the body. And so he summarized all this research, put out this groundbreaking book called The Relaxation Response, and his research is what heralded in the beginning of the mind-body interest, the interest in the connections between the mind and the body. In terms of neurogenesis, what Benson found and later researchers found is that there were two types of spiritual practices that had the biggest impact on brain development. The two are mindfulness practices and practices of compassion. So mindfulness practices, what I mean by that is those spiritual practices that are aimed at bringing the body, bringing the spirit into the present moment. All right, maybe it's just me, but sometimes my mind has a tendency, it seems, to worry about the past, to fret about the past and worry about the future. Am I the only one that's affected by that? And, oh, by the way, did you know, I'm just going to show off here a little bit, did you know that the word for worry in the New Testament, the Greek word for worry, means divided mind? It's two words put together that mean to divide the mind. Pastor Mike, you're welcome. You can use that for your charge. So the mindfulness practices that you might be most familiar with are those that have focused attention on sensations like the sensation of the breath. Have you done this where you try to clear, well, you can't clear your mind. There's really a misnomer, but you try to settle your mind and pay attention to your breath, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in. And when you feel your mind wander or something else start to creep in, don't be too hard on yourself. Just refocus. It's my breath. I'm focusing on my breath, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in. This attentional, and then the idea is that you can bring this attentional capacity, this capacity to focus your attention into other areas of your life. So beyond the practice of meditation itself, to be able to bring that into other areas of your life. 
mindfulness meditation of course is now studied extensively there are research centers that i know about at harvard yale stanford u c berkeley u c l a and i'm sure others uh as well it's very well researched because in addition to reducing stress and managing pain research is indicating impressive results in the adhd uh, also helps us increase empathy and emotion regulation our self-esteem and just our overall psycho psychological well-being now how does it work on a biological level um, again to kind of geek on the science a little bit remember i said that uh, neurogenesis happens for adults in the hippocampus and the olfactory areas well whereas most neurogenesis happens somewhere in the hippocampus but doesn't touch hippocampus runs uh, across both paths of the, of the brain and doesn't see it seems to increase only certain portions mindfulness meditation on the other hand has been shown to increase the size of the hippocampus along the its uh, entire length the entire size of the hippocampus uh, beginning all the way with the cortical structures especially in the prefrontal cortex so uh, i'll come back to this in the uh, the next section the mind section in just a minute but uh, you may have seen it's pretty widely reported some of the studies with the uh, nuns who who had a daily practice uh, they were teachers and they had a daily practice of meditation as well and they all uh, you know god loved the nuns of course and, and religious orders in general kind of dumb thing to say god loves religious <laughs> orders and everyone else um and they all donated their, their brains to science mm -hmm. so not only were they were we able to study through neuroimaging and some of the techniques while they're alive you know biochemical techniques but also by way of autopsy and uh much healthier much healthier brains uh, and you know some of the thought was a they were lifelong skipping ahead here a little bit they were lifelong learners engaged in activities that they did not know an idea they were not built with an idea of uh, retirement they continue teaching continue staying active mentally but also this daily practice of meditation now uh, research has shown that with as little as 15 to 20 minutes a day for as few as four to six weeks you can begin to see results neurogenesis in that brief amount of time so it's not a matter of devoting your whole life to the practice of meditation it's, it's as few as as little as 15 to 20 minutes a day or as few as four to six weeks when you be, can begin to see this neurogenesis genesis this growth in neural development so um, it's open to to all of us uh, when we get to the strength section I'll talk a little bit about uh, about tying together practices of meditation with physical practices such as yoga and stretching. So that's uh, meditation. The second set of spiritual practices that has been shown to significantly uh, improve neural growth are the practices of compassion. Now these can be uh, uh, basically anything that's designed to improve uh, love or empathy or devotion. They take different forms, of course, depending on the religion. It can be something as simple as serving in a food kitchen or uh, at a homeless shelter on a regular basis. I, I know that uh, the sponsor tonight, the uh, Hope Church of Lawrence, is uh, very connected, as Pastor Mike said, to, to ministry uh, in uh, living centers. And it's that kind of thing, that kind of practice of compassion, of extending oneself beyond oneself. That on the science side, uh, neuroimaging shows that these practices increase the blood flow in critical areas of the brain. There's something about kind of getting outside of yourself, getting outside of your own, uh, caring only, thinking only about yourself, that seems to increase the production of neurons. There's an institute, I mentioned it on the bibliography, positive emotions such as love and care and gratitude, empathy and appreciation. 
and their research, and again, it's longitudinal, it's based on years and years of research, indicates that not only do these emotions have a strong stress-reducing effect, but they qualitatively increase immunity and provide a greater sense of coherence between the brain waves. It's really a remarkable study. On the one hand, it's stuff that the better parts of our religious traditions have long told us, but yet it's still remarkable, in my mind at least, that now we can use neuroimaging and other ways to test it. In fact, this is healthy, and this does help to... It's the same thing. It's oxytocin that is released, melatonin, which we'll talk about in a minute, BHEA are all stimulated when you serve others. These are known hormonal stimulants of neurogenesis, and they're released by doing meditation, by engaging in meditation and compassion practices. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. So now to the mind. Now, as I said from the beginning, it's holistic. It takes all of this. Having said that, the mind kind of holds a special place among the four, the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual stimulation. The mind kind of holds a special place. Actively engaging our minds pays off both by promoting neurogenesis and, secondly, by enlarging our world. So when we learn new things about our world, it expands our outlook, right? It gives us a wider perspective on life. It deepens our empathy. Nowhere is the adage, use it or lose it, more applicable than when it comes to your mind. I had an uncle, we all had this uncle, who, when he retired, said, I'm not going to lift a finger. I'm not doing anything. And he pretty much did not lift a finger for the short remainder of his life. So there are two times that cognitive testing indicates a real drop-off in mental abilities. You want to guess? Right after leaving school and right after uh, retirement. They don't have to, though. These are people who, like my uncle, choose you know, to not lift a finger, not to continue learning, not to continue contributing. This is the functional part that I mentioned before, one of the ways that we're able to measure neurogenesis. If our mental functions stay strong or improve, there's still neural growth. So let's dig into the mind a little bit. There are basically six mental functions, six things that uh, ways that scientists, neuroscientists group our mental functions. The first is called executive function. Now, executive function includes problem solving, it includes planning, uh, working memory, flexibility, decision making. Executive function. Uh, it comes from uh, the prefrontal cortex, you might have guessed, uh, most recently evolved part of the brain. And uh, it allows us to plan for the future or to postpone immediate gratification uh, for the sake of greater gratification, things like that. Helps us juggle different factors, helps us uh, decide what is a priority, uh, what's a top priority and a lesser priority. Uh, Executive functions, that part of the mind that inhibits our tendencies to act on impulse. So it kind of overrides the reptilian, the brain stem, the reptilian part of the brain, and allows us to reason to figure out the best course of action. That's what we mean by executive function. That's one of the mental functions of, of the mind. The second is memory. And of course, this is one that gets talked about a lot. Memory really needs to be discussed as three different subcategories, working memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Working memory is what allows us to do several things, uh, hold several things in our memory at the same time. So the example I like to use here is if you are uh, if you have a number of errands that you need to run, uh, you know, for which you, that you need to drive to do different errands. And so uh, it's your working memory that allows you to organize which errands you'll do in what order so that the route makes the most sense uh, when, when you leave your house. And don't forget, of course, that you have to stop by the grocery store last because you don't want the cold food to get hot or hot food to get cold sitting in the car, right? So that's your working memory that uh, processes all, all of that. Uh, working memory is easily overwhelmed by anxiety or all kind of intuitively know that uh, you're you're trying to organize all these things and there's 
high degree of stress or anxiety or something that it goes uh, sideways, let's say, at, at the office, and you're like, okay, I can't remember what in the world I was just doing, right? Short term memory uh, is that information we hold for very brief amounts of time, maybe only 60 seconds uh, or less. Um, most studies indicate that most people can hold about seven items maximum in their short term memory. Uh, plus or minus a little bit, of course. Uh, ever wondered why phone numbers are seven digits? And things like that. Long term memory, by contrast, is just what the name implies. It's the it's holding those memories. Uh, but the thing is, of course, uh, for them to for those memories to make it to the long term, they have to be transferred from short term to long term. It can be in the long term memory declarative memory. There are two types of long term memories: declarative memory, which is what we consciously can recall at any time, or procedural memory, which helps us perform many activities that we do even without being consciously aware of them. It. It's just become a part of our long term memory. When I'm, when I'm working with athletes, I, uh, basketball is the sport that I most often work with athletes, and I coach girls basketball as well, high school girls basketball. And we talk about muscle memory, and that's essentially the same thing. So it's it's doing a, an act, you know, like a, say basketball is a game, a game of habits. It's doing something so much that it becomes habitual, so that it moves beyond consciously thinking it through. To rather, yeah, that feels correct. Okay, that was me shooting a shot in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> and that does not because I've got my arm out of alignment, so things like that. So it's a type of long term memory. The next mental function is emotion regulation. I've already touched on that a little bit. It's acting in ways that make us feel better and decrease feeling bad. It's the capacity for our self control or our self soothing or our self care. Helps us regulate how we experience stress or anxiety, shame, anger. Helps us tolerate uh, feelings without acting in that reptilian part of the brain, fight or flight. So that's emotion regulation. The next mental function, am I going too fast? Is uh, attention and focus. Now, attention can be both diffuse or it can be very focused. Uh, so think of it this way. Uh, as far as an image goes, attention can be like a floodlight, diffuse in general, or it can be like a spotlight, very focused, very specific. The attention, the ability to concentrate our attention, to keep it focused, is of course key to accomplishing most anything. And it's it's uh, the more complex the task, the greater the need for focus and attention, and obviously conditions like ADD, ADHD. And other others indicate impairments in the ability to concentrate and focus attention. And then there are two more. So that you should have four down. There are two more: crystallized intelligence and fluid intelligence. Crystallized intelligence and fluid intelligence. They are the, the newer concepts in cognitive science. Uh, crystallized intelligence is the ability to make use of our experiences of acquired in our acquired knowledge. Crystallized intelligence is the ability to make use of our experiences in our acquired knowledge. Um, it is our accumulated vocabularies and experiences, our overall knowledge. For some people, especially those who have worked to evade uh, what you know, neurotoxins, the things that break down the brain, and have worked to embrace neural health, then this crystallized intelligence uh, builds over time. And so ideally, of course, uh, the older we are, the more experience we have on which to draw, and so the greater our crystallized intelligence is. The issue becomes the expression of that crystallized intelligence. Another book that's on your bibliography, which is fabulous, is called The Secret Life of the Grown-Up Brain. Uh, Grown-Up Mind, I mean, I'm sorry. And she talks in, in that book a lot about crystallized intelligence and, and the expression of crystallized intelligence. Uh, any Harry Potter fans in the room? Uh, Nick Dumbledore says uh, uh, more than once, but says to the effect uh, that uh, the young, that the old should always uh, have sympathy for the young because they were once young, whereas the young have never yet been old. That kind of thing, right? Well, 
intelligence. So it's a crystallized intelligence. It's that which accumulates over time. Fluid intelligence, the very last one, operates independently of acquired knowledge. So that's why I saved it for last. It is that ability to adapt to something that you have not seen before. You're not responding to a set of criteria or circumstances that you have seen previously. You are adapting to a new set of criteria or circumstances. One person that I do only fitness training with works in the area of data intelligence and cybersecurity. And so you can imagine his fluid intelligence is, I'm sure, off the charts. I mean, you can tell just in a conversation with him. It's kind of scary sometimes, his ability to transfer information and to adapt it to a new set. So these are the mental functions that we all do in our very complex lives. Again, pointing to that absolute miracle that is the brain. We manage a great many relationships. We perform tasks. We experience desire. We perceive. We remember. We fantasize. And we do much more. And it's kind of a shame, in a sense, that we take so much of this for granted. Because this is what makes us very ordinary people capable of extraordinary comprehension and capacity. Now, while all these mental functions interplay with each other, memory, of course, is fundamental to all of them. Memory is key. The word dementia, to now switch to Latin, the word dementia, the DE means without. The METIA, mentia, comes from mens, meaning mind or memory. So dementia without mind or without memory. The hippocampus is responsible for organizing new memories in the brain. It acts as a processing center, like I said a minute ago, for the formation of new memory. And as also I mentioned earlier, neurogenesis is occurring. We monitor how neurogenesis is occurring, not post-mortem, before death, by neuroimaging, blood flow, and performance testing. And then post-mortem studies is what helps to confirm this. Now, part of the reason that I went to that effort to outline the six types of mental functions is, again, to emphasize the integrated and holistic nature for adult brain neurogenesis. For now, at least, for now, there's no magic pill. You can't pop a pill and have it take care of all your neurogenesis. But a combination of a healthy emotional environment that is enriched, along with exercise, along with diet, we're going to talk about, a holistic combination engages the heart, soul, mind, and strength, can work to prevent cognitive decline and promote cognitive development. So another institute that I name on bibliography called the Buck Institute in California, really exciting place, has run a series of studies where they have done this. So non-pharmacological, let me just make sure I'm being somewhat clear, non-pharmacological studies where they have shown improvements in the memory of Alzheimer's patients and those with early onset dementia consistently. It's holistic in the sense that I'm talking about here because it included diet and exercise. It included omega-3s. We'll talk about melatonin, vitamin D. And it eliminated simple sugars and better sleep. Oh, and one other thing. This is a series of studies that I'm just waiting for someone to debunk. So in other words, it's a series of studies that I don't like the outcome of, and so I'm just waiting for someone to tell me otherwise. Long-term caffeine use, even in low doses, not good. I know, I don't like that. But there have been generations of graduate students. I mean, graduate labs, of course, run on caffeine and who've tried to debunk this. Long-term caffeine use, even in moderate doses, is harmful to neural growth, neural development. Sorry for the bad news. Again, as soon as someone debunks that, I'm going to be really happy. So let's make this actionable. 
there are mental practices that all of us can do for neurogenesis. Pastor Mike mentioned crossword puzzles. They're excellent. Sudoku is excellent. However, these don't show very good generalized ability. Okay? So doing multiple crossword puzzles may help you become a crossword puzzle master, but not so much in other cognitive areas. Now, again, it's better than nothing, of course. It keeps you a little bit sharp, your vocabulary working. Sudoku, the same thing. They do not show much generalized ability to other cognitive functions. They do stimulate, but they don't show as much. What does? Learn a foreign language. I'm not the best at learning languages either, but here's why. If you learn a foreign language, it's a body of knowledge that you can continually add to. It's a cumulative body. It's a cumulative attempt to add to it. You're engaging your brain in a couple different areas, and if you're attempting to speak the language, even more so. And you can return to it over time. It's kind of the same thing as being cumulative. It's not episodic the way a crossword puzzle is or a Sudoku puzzle is. I forgot to put this on the bibliography. I realize that driving over here. But I've come across a podcast that I really like. So one of the languages that I try to speak is French. And I came across a podcast called Coffee Break French. There's also a Coffee Break Spanish. Each episode is 15 minutes. They're both produced by a Scottish guy. So you have kind of a fun Scottish accent also on top of that. And then there's a student. I don't know if she really is or not, but she plays the role of being a student on the podcast. And she's delightful from Glasgow, so she has a really thick accent. And they're brief, and they're easy to listen to, and you can just kind of go on with them. I'm really enjoying the Coffee Break French, and so I put that out there to you to help with this. Let's see. So I'm not discouraging crossword puzzles or Sudoku or some of the apps on your phone like Luminosity. It's just that they're very limited. So what else? High-level math. You want to re-suggest yourself to that? Good luck. Any musical instrument. Any musical instrument. And the regions of the brain, by the way, that are affected by learning musical instruments and math are the same. It is the same. Now, if you're going to start, my recommendation is just start, or if you want to start small, like if all that seems too intimidating, just start brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand carefully. Or start eating with your non-dominant hand. Or every now and then, when it's not anything legal, try to write with your non-dominant hand. That kind of stuff. Because it helps develop the brain. Excuse me. Helps develop the brain in cross-hemispheric ways. So in addition to that, reading, writing, problem solving through board puzzles, board games. You know, if you've got a place where you can put a puzzle out and work on it with others, that's also a good social activity. Think through a house repair project, the steps that you would take in a house repair project. Give attention and concentration exercises. Do, again, executive function tasks like organizing or cleaning. Sorry about that. Or participate in a discussion group. Because, again, it's that emotional stability part as well. Book clubs are great for this very reason, right? You're reading, you're processing information, you're formulating your argument. I mean, not in a not in a way that is combative, but your thoughts about the book, you're attempting to express that, and then you get the social benefit, social benefit as well. So sometimes I get questions about online video games. So there is some evidence that online video games, particularly with older older adults, are beneficial and and do generalize to things like 
driving better, stuff like that, being able to uh, spatial skills and uh, so on, uh, or respond to visual cues. Now here's the downside, right? A lot of those uh, darn games are so vibrant. I mean, and they're, I mean, again, you like luminosity and folks, you know, ones like that, but those don't have the generalizability. A lot of the video games, though, are if, if they've got a plot to them, it's a vibrant plot. You know, but, um, so there's an opportunity. You know, if any of you are software developers, there's a real opportunity there. The thing here is to think about variety. Think about learning in different types of ways, through lectures, through reading, through writing, in person as much as possible, and do what you enjoy. It is much, much better to pick up two or three or four things that you enjoy than to try to force yourself to do what some expert said was the best. Good luck, right? Uh, the, ultimately, the goal is to be, and you knew this was coming, a lifelong. Uh, let's talk about one activity that is clearly bad for you. Bad. See, I tried to deep, deepen my voice when I said that. And that's watching too much television. Um, some TV, some may spark new ideas. It may help you, for instance, to consider uh, different types of relationships than you would in real life. That type of thing it may help you move beyond your comfort zone a little bit. So, but passively watching TV for hours, not just you know, demonstrably bad for your brain. Uh, regions of the brain just basically shut down. As much as 20% increased risk for cognitive impairment for people who watch three hours or more television per day. We all know people, you know, those other people who watch at least three hours of TV a day, right? Sometimes folks want to debate this idea, and I can uh, point you to the research if, if you want. Uh, but um, now, let me also say this. Uh, if someone is in a, um, a living center, a nursing home type situation, and the uh, options are watching television or Staring, staring at the wall, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, then it's probably a draw. Uh, and so, um, yeah, but it's much better to act any kind of active pursuit, such as reading or listening to music or talking or interacting with others. Oh, and music is neurostimulative. Um, and there is some, I'll get you in just a second, give me one second. Um, there is some idea, and so, you know, what type of music is best. There is some idea that classical music, Mozart, for example, for some reason particularly stimulates uh, young children uh, and, and beyond. But again, I think more important is the type of music that you enjoy. Um, I'm waiting for the study that says reggae is uh, especially beneficial because that's what I enjoy. Yeah, did you have a, a quick question? Yeah, say, yeah. Uh, well, dancing is going to come under the body section here in a second. Uh, but uh, saying, uh, yeah, you're right. I just take a stretch break for about 35 seconds because the next section, so we've done heart, soul, or what are we doing? What we forgot about your heart, soul, mind, and now we're going to strength. Strength is the biggest section uh, because we're going to talk about both exercise and diet. It, it's what you came for. Uh, so uh, I'll let you take a stretch break. If you choose to leave, you know, it's up to you, but um, but this is what you came for here in a second. So, two minutes. While you're doing that, I want to give you some illustrative information. Since I'm a pastor, I love illustrations. As you can see, um, I've taken Nathan's advice about caffeine to heart. He did say drink more caffeine, right? Now I can't I can't disprove his caffeine theory. I know that caffeine has some real beneficial uh,
properties for colon cancer, which runs in my wife's family. So my theory is I keep drinking caffeine to prevent the colon cancer, or at least delay it. And by the time that the colon cancer comes, I won't have the memory to remember that I've got it. So I think that that works. He needed a, he needed a theory. <laughs> there are still refreshments in the back. Please help yourself. Um, if you need the restrooms, they're to the lobby. Women's are down that way. Men's are down this way. Thank <laughs> you. 